Bonjour. Um, my name is uh, Clarissa. I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you very much for having me. Before we start, I saw on the meetup group that there was somebody who was worried they wouldn't be able to understand due to language barriers. Is that person here today? No? Okay, great. Uh, I was going to say that uh, I speak a little bit of French, so uh, if you have more questions and you'd like me to explain later in French, I will try my very best. Je vais essayer. Okay, so um, uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, smarter lead management. Basically, the question of how to organize your contacts efficiently so that all the fish you catch in your net actually stay in the net. So why did I choose this topic? I chose this topic because I work for a company called Team Leader. Team Leader is an all-in-one CRM, project management and invoicing software that helps small and medium-sized businesses to stay organized, to manage their contacts, build better relationships and collaborate with their teams in one single tool. It's basically um, a, a, a tool that is supposed to help uh, businesses to focus on what matters and increase their growth. Basically, what our tool does is help you to avoid the situation you see here on the slide behind me. It's that situation where you ha are completely flooded with emails, with phone calls, with tasks, with things you have to do. Chances are, if you're here at the family, you are either an entrepreneur already or you're thinking about opening a business. At some point in your uh, career and at some point in the stage of your startup, you will be at a point where you are a little bit overwhelmed. And it's completely normal because in the beginning stages you have very little time and very little resources. That's why our biggest module is CRM. And it's also the most important one. So I would like to share some of our insights that we've learned along the way when it comes to managing your leads. And with leads, I don't mean clients who are already paying customers, who are already engaged with your business, but leads are prospects. I think in French, the word is also prospect, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, that's good. If you guys are nodding, that means I'm not wrong. So let's start with a very general question. What are your goals for your company or organization? When I ask you this question, think a little bit in your head about how you would answer. So no matter what your business is, whether it's disrupting a market, or whether you want to change the way people interact with each other, or maybe you want to be the next best car sharing economy, whatever it is, I'm guessing that in order to achieve this goal, you would have to do two things. One of them is increasing your sales, and the other one is increasing your growth. But how do you go about doing that? Do you invest more into marketing or maybe into Google AdWords? Think about all of the marketing channels you may already use or the marketing channels you will use in the future. This ranges from events, from seminars, from workshops, to webinars, to email marketing, or maybe you buy your ads on Facebook. Whatever it is that you're doing, it costs, I'm guessing, some money. But why would you invest more when the problem actually lies elsewhere? Not enough leads are converted into paying customers. So if you look at this slide here, <laughs> I'm guessing all of you know South Park. Is there anyone who doesn't know South Park? If not, you're, you're missing out. <laughs> When I looked at this picture for the first time, I thought, okay, the only four really important people in this picture are the four in the front. Kyle, Cartman, Kenny, and Stan. But what about all those people in the back? No matter how small your business is, no matter how little leads you have, it's important to make sure you don't lose out on any opportunities. So even if you think that these people in the back aren't important for you, because at this moment they cannot help you with your business or they don't want your product. Or maybe they say, sorry, I'm not at a stage right now where I'm interested in buying your service. You don't know what will happen in the future. The girl with the red hair in the middle between Kyle and Cartman. This could well be your next, I don't know, um, supporter of your crowdfunding campaign that you didn't know you were going to do. Or it could be an investor who says, no, at this moment, your business isn't interesting for me, but it might be in the future. Or it's someone who's willing to give you feedback on your product, a potential user. 
or it's a potential client, someone who at the moment may not seem obvious to you as relevant for you and your company, but it could be in the future. Whoopsa, whoopsa. So no matter how many leads you have in the funnel, it's important to make sure you really don't let any of those proverbial fish in the net slip through. I'm gonna work with a, a very general percentage here. You can say that for most marketeers, five and 10% of leads convert into clients. And this is based on a survey that was done, I think in 2013, so not quite up to date, but I'm guessing that it's more or less the same nowadays. Five and 10%, that's the number you want to increase. You want to think about ways on how you can bring that up to maybe 15 or 20%. So how can you increase those numbers? In order to answer that question, I think it would make sense to think first about the problems and the mistakes that most people are doing nowadays when it comes to lead management. The first biggest mistake in lead management is that there is no process. Now what do I mean with no process? No process means no structure, no plan in how to deal with leads that come into contact with your company. If you have no process, you probably follow up on leads haphazardly. That means inefficiently. A phone call here, an email there. Maybe you promise, okay, I'm gonna send you a message next week after I get back from Paris, but maybe you forget. Maybe the lead tells you, please reach out to me in March 2017, because by then I'm sure that I will need your product. Whatever it is, you need a way to systematically structure how you deal with the leads that come into contact with you. If you don't do that, you have no goal to work towards, you have no mistakes to correct, you have no plan to implement. Your team will probably be working in different ways without an aligned plan, without an aligned goal, which means you will have to consolidate their efforts. If your team is doing things unsystematically, chances are it will probably come off as a little bit unprofessional. Because what you want is to give an image to your uh, potential clients and your paying customers that everything is going according to plan, that everything is aligned, that everything is more or less um, consolidated. The reason that you want to do this, and the reason why you want to set up a process, is so that you can make sure that every name in your database and I hope you do have a database. If not, you should have a database, preferably with a CRM tool. You want to make sure that each name in your database doesn't just stay a name. Because if it stays just a name, you might as well just have them in your LinkedIn network. And if you're like me and I have well over one and a half thousand contacts, I'm not gonna remember what each and every person does, what their background is, where I met them, how I could possibly collaborate with them in the future. The second biggest mistake is improper lead registration. What does that mean? Yesterday, I went to a conference here in Paris called Salon des Entrepreneurs. Does anybody know it? Yeah? Was anybody there, actually? Oh, you were there. Okay, great. So I don't have to tell you that there are a lot of people walking through those halls, like a lot. I stood there all day and I was constantly talking. So. Since my job is basically to go around conferences and uh, meet people, network, talk to them, and fill my funnel with leads, I usually come back with a suitcase, okay, maybe not a suitcase because we're not in Mad Men in the 1950s, but a backpack with a huge stack of business cards. And I actually do, my stack is about this big. But who were they? Who were these people who gave me their business cards? What did we talk about? What was their interest in my business? Maybe we came up with a, a way we can collaborate in the future. Or maybe we talked about something that I definitely should remember next time I get into contact with them. Whatever it is, you need to make sure that you register your leads properly so you know the context in which you should approach them later. I'm not gonna say that you only have one shot when it comes to leads because it's maybe not that dramatic, but every shot counts. So every point of contact you have with a potential lead is important. You need to make the most out of each call, out of each email. You need to really curate your communication and your engagement with them to make sure that you maximize your efforts and to make sure that you know, okay, 
I am qualifying my own efforts, I know that my approach is the right one and that I'm not wasting any time for me, for my colleagues, and for the potential lead. An example of why lead registration could make sense could be, for example, okay, you meet somebody who says, in my case, I, I work for a company that does a CRM tool. Oh, I didn't even start my business yet. I don't need a CRM tool because I don't have contacts. But I will start my business in June. So if you can get back into contact with me in June, I'd be very happy. I think, okay, June, that's not so far away. I'll make a little note in my notebook. But until June, my notebook is probably going to be full of things, of tasks, of notes, and things that I write down. What if I forget? What if that lead then calls me and I don't remember who he or she is? How embarrassing is that? Or if I ask the contrary question, how great is it if a lead gets back into contact with you after a while, you see the name in the email or the number in the phone call, and you remember, oh, that's right, in my CRM here, I did my proper lead registration. This person wants this. These are his or her needs. This is what we talked about, and we met at Salon des Entrepreneurs in Paris back then in February. That gives a much better customer service and a much better level of attention to the person that you're engaging with. The third biggest mistake in lead management is that there's no reporting. So the first time I heard the word reporting, I was still studying and I thought, oh, that sounds like something super, super boring. And it actually is kind of annoying, I agree. But they say that the numbers tell the tale. And in this case, they really, really, really do. With reporting, I mean analysis. I mean learning from the information you get and learning from your experiences. How will you know where your problem lies in your sales funnel, in your process, if you don't do reporting, if you don't analyze what happened in the past? Think about how amazing it would be if you could say, okay, the probability that this lead, based on their business, their needs, how big the company is, where you met them, and how they got into contact with you, is probably 50% that they will convert into a paying customer. That could help you immensely to plan your future, to plan how you structure the next steps. How will you know what type of lead is even the best type of lead for you to convert? So if you come into contact with a lot of people, like we're here today at the family, I'm sure all of you do something, something different or maybe even something similar, probably not all of you will be relevant to each other. But if I get all of your business cards later and we talk about potential ways to collaborate, I will know based on my previous experiences and based on the way I registered my leads and the way I analyzed them that maybe you and you and you are most likely to convert into a customer for my business because I analyzed the experiences that I had. And one of the things I think is really important once you've had a process, because by now, uh, since we talked about process, you will have had a process, it's really important to see in which phase of your process a lead is most likely to convert. That's something that you can work with, something that you can optimize, something that you can tweak. The last thing that I want to mention in terms of reporting is that if you don't do reporting, you will have no way of how do I say this diplomatically, of setting up an actionable plan. And with actionable, I mean, I don't just mean, okay, let's try and convert them. Let's try and make sure that they actually set up an account with my service or that they buy my product. With actionable, I mean, what are literally the next steps? Maybe I want to get in contact with the lead after exactly five days after they signed up on my, on my website. Why five days? Because I learned in my analysis that five days is the optimal time to reach out again and say, hi, knock, knock, how are you doing? Thank you for activating a demo or thank you for signing up for my newsletter. Can I interest you in, I don't know, an article? Can I interest you in a call? Should we continue to talk about your needs and how we can help you? So to summarize, the three biggest mistakes that people do when they manage their leads is not having a process, not registering their leads, and not analyzing and doing reporting based on their experiences. So now that we've talked about the problems a little bit, I'd like to talk about how the solutions and how to do it better. The 
the first step of setting up a process, because it's the obvious uh, solution to not having one, is qualification. What does qualification mean? Qualification is just a fancy word for filtering. How do you set up a filter? How do you go about doing that? How do you define the criteria that you need to have and that you need to be aware of whenever you come into contact with a lead? You can ask yourself a bunch of questions. So these are just some examples, some very standard examples that you can use. But obviously, you should customize this and personalize this according to your business and what you're doing. One of the questions you could ask is, does this lead actually have a problem that we can solve? Because if you spend three hours writing emails, doing phone calls, and maybe doing a virtual demo online with a person who, it turns out, actually doesn't have a problem you can solve, that's a lot of resources wasted. The second thing is, is this lead actually able to pay for our product or our service? Yesterday at Salon des Entrepreneurs, I met a woman, she came up to me and she said, oh, okay, you have a gestion de projet, gestion de contact, oh, it's cool. So basically, you're like Salesforce. And I said, no, actually, we're not like Salesforce. Salesforce is focusing on one thing, and for bigger enterprises, we are actually uh, focused on small and medium-sized businesses, and we have a modular subscription model. And she said, yeah, actually, I was wondering that because I spent so much time at their stand, and I was talking to them about my business and what I need, and I was totally convinced, and in the end, they told me the price, and I realized it's just completely not for me. I can't afford it at this stage. I have three people in my business. I cannot afford to pay for the huge package that Salesforce offers because I am not qualified, as if we're going to talk about qualification, for this product. The third thing is, how is your lead currently solving or not solving his or her problem? So to come back to the uh, example of Salesforce, if this woman came to me and she said, listen, I'm looking for a CRM tool, I actually have one right now, one to, to organize my sales cycle and my funnel, but it's too expensive for me, then I know, okay, this person knows a lot about CRM tools but is paying too much, so I immediately know which are the touch points. I can say, we offer you these functionalities for a lower price and for more flexibility. That will hook them way more than if I just launch into a general demonstration and a general introduction about what my product or service does. And the last two are quite, uh, quite obvious. Is there a willingness to change? There was somebody yesterday who came to our stand and who said, yeah, but I don't understand what's the value of your product exactly. I said, well, the value is that it's all in one. It's integrated. You don't have to log in and out into three different tools to do your project management, your CRM, and your invoicing. It's basically all integrated into one centralized solution. And he told me, well, but I like to keep it separated. I think it's good that I have to log into Asana for my project management or, I don't know, uh, Exact Online for my accounting and my bookkeeping and my invoicing. I like that. So then I think, okay, that's fair. I'm not going to force you to change it. I can only explain to you what the benefits are of centralizing it. But if there's no willingness to change, then this lead can more or less be filtered out, still registered, of course, but filtered out and you move on to spend your time on the next lead. And the last one is uh, something that um, it's uh, maybe uh, not always important at uh, early stages of a company, but it's something that I think can be very uh, useful. If you consider how can this lead be a multiplicator? What can he or she or this company offer us in terms of reference, word of mouth promotion, or maybe advertising and maybe partnerships? Only after you have qualified someone as a lead you can really go after because they fulfill a certain set of criteria and, they, and they, they can answer yes to a certain set of questions that you have defined beforehand, only then do you go about and you follow up. You delegate a task, you set up a meeting or a demo or a Skype call or whatever it is that your process dictates. Not dictates, but that your process suggests. The second part about setting up a process is quite easy, and that's setting up a lead journey. So the word lead journey already basically says it all. What you see here is very, very simple and very general. A new lead comes in, the new lead is qualified, you come into negotiation phase where you talk about price, you talk about services, you talk about deliverables, then an offer is made, an offer is negotiated, 
And then the lead is either won or lost. The deal happens or it doesn't happen. This is, like I said, very general. If you have an e-commerce business, your lead, journey, your lead journey is probably gonna be a little bit different. You will probably have a different touch point than let's say a catering service. So you need to make sure that the process you come up with and the questions you ask to set up the process are customized to your business. I cannot go into so much detail here because we're gonna keep it quite general, but if you want to talk to me about that afterwards, you're very welcome to. The tip you see at the bottom is something that we learned along the way. So we are three years old, we've scaled to three countries, two more countries coming this year, so within one and a half years, we doubled the amount of employees and we're growing very quickly. Had we not had a process in the very beginning that considered scalability, we would not be where we are today. And with scalability, I mean, how can you make sure that your system works no matter how high the number of clients or partners or leads gets. You need to be able to handle it and to handle it efficiently because otherwise you'll just be drowning in work and you won't be efficient. This here, okay, it looks very, uh, it looks very complicated but I'm gonna walk you through it very simply. This is our sales structure. This is how we work in my business. And I'm going to show this because it's really nice to see the, the journey that a lead goes through and how you structure and how you delegate responsibilities within your team. So on the left side, you have the marketeer. The marketeer is responsible for bringing in the leads, whether it's through content or AdWords or events, referrals, promotion or marketing automation tools. The marketer is the person who brings that lead in and gets him or her to activate a trial. So in our case, it's a trial because we have an online uh, uh, product, right? After the lead comes in and activates a trial, the inside sales rep jumps in and connects with the lead. He connects via a short call or a mail or a demo or whatever it is and maybe follows up with some illustrations, with some advice, with some more information on pricing. After that, once he's engaged with the lead and asked the questions that, they, that we have defined for us, he's qualified. Once the lead is qualified, it comes to a demo. In our case, that means a walkthrough of how our product works. It's a one hour call and we really explain, okay, this is how it works, this is what you can do, this is how you can integrate with different apps, this is how you can use it for your business. Then the closer comes in. The closer is the sales rep that is focused only on closing that deal and converting it into a paying customer. So you see here that we have several responsibilities and several roles in our organization I have structured the sales cycle and the lead process according to what works best for us because this for us is very scalable. After the lead has hopefully been closed via a virtual or a face-to-face -face demo, he becomes a paying customer and then the customer success manager takes over and makes sure that they feel great and that they feel happy with our service. And then this, the, the lead is, or the customer in this case, is trained via webinars or touchless or a blog or face-to-face -face conversation. So if you look at this structure, try and think about how your product and how your business would be set up to make sure that it's scalable. So this is, like I said, an example of ours, but it makes sense to visualize your path and to visualize your system. The second thing, obviously, is to register your lead accurately. How do you register them? There are two kinds of data that you can register. There's explicit data, which, are, which is the name, the email, the language or currency the lead uses, um, the phone number, the country that he or she is based in. Then there's also implicit data. Implicit data is all of the information that you get when you read between the lines. So in our case, it's interesting for us to know what did this lead type into Google as a keyword to end up on our websites? Did they type in CRM tool optimize business? Or did they type in alternative to Salesforce? Or did they type in something else? That helps us to curate the approach when we get into contact with the lead. Implicit data is also something that 
gives you information on the expectation of a lead. For example, the language. If the language doesn't fit to your service or your product, well, that's an implicit piece of information that you should research and find out beforehand. A tip that we have here is that if you work with, let's say, a form, please fill out your name, number, and email address to subscribe to our newsletter, or to request a demo, or to, I don't know, set up a 14-day free trial account. If you do work with things like that, please make sure that the barrier is as low as possible. Because the more information a lead has to fill out, the less likely he or she will fill it out. Right? Because, let's face it, we're all lazy nowadays. The third thing I'd like to talk about is outbound leads. So, what are outbound leads? Most of what I've talked about right now is more or less inbound leads, right? People who come to your website, people who come to your stand at a fair, who give you their business card, who send you an email, or maybe they ask for an introduction from someone in your network because they know that you work for your company. That's an inbound lead. An outbound lead is somebody that you actively go after. It's someone that you reach out to, someone that, or a company, that you think could make use of your product. Someone that you think could make use of a collaboration and who would be beneficial. They might need even more attention because they didn't visit your website on their own accord. Maybe they are a passive lead, so to speak. So it's important also to understand how you deal with outbound leads as opposed to inbound leads. And the last point, obviously, is to enrich your data. And I think here within the startup ecosystem, it's not, I don't have to tell you how important it is to look at someone's LinkedIn profile, see what they tweet about, you know, check out their social media profiles, see if they maybe go to the same events, and if there's someone in your network that knows them and who can give you advice or feedback on whether or not this company or this person is relevant for you. One thing I'd like to add is that if you use a tool, and I, by this tool I don't necessarily mean our tool, it would be great, but if you use a tool, make sure that you have the possibility of using something like a, like a tag system or a segment system. Because when you're registering your leads and you want to make sure that your data is up to date, you need to be able to add as much information in as a structured way as possible. So, the last point about analyzing your lead management. These are some questions here that I think are relevant for most businesses and most services. How many leads actually came in in the first quarter? How many were lost? Why were they lost? In which phase of the cycle were they lost? Were they lost because you took too long to get back into contact? Or because your qualification system in your web form wasn't correct? How many leads and mails actually went in, uh, actually converted into uh, paying customers? Maybe you'll see that it doesn't really help to send information via email. Maybe it only helps to get into contact with them personally and set up a meeting or go to their office and talk about and present how you can benefit them. And most importantly, what are the pending actions? How do you continue? How do you move forward? Visualizing your customer journey is something I think that is quite obvious. As I showed you before with that complicated slide with all the little boxes, it helps you to visualize because you see immediately what the journey is and what the pending actions are and who is responsible for what. So, no matter how good you think your memory is, it isn't, make sure you have a process. Make sure you have a process from the beginning, no matter how small you are and how little leads are in your funnel. The more efficient you are from the beginning, the easier you will make your life in the end. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty, meaning don't be afraid to really, really sit down and think about, okay, how can I register them so that I will pat myself on the back in one year and think, oh, thank God I wrote down that this person is very, very uh, insulted if I speak to them in French instead of in Flemish, for example, which is actually a real case. Uh, we're a Belgian company and, uh, no, really, I'm, I'm not joking, we're a Belgian company and, uh, uh, as you know, in Belgium you speak French and you speak Flemish and with some leads it's very important that you don't call them and you speak to them in Netherlands because they feel very francophone 
and they will not like that. So if you register this in the beginning, it will save you so much hassle. And the last thing, obviously, is that reporting is annoying, I know. Short term, it's probably going to be something you don't really want to do because it doesn't help you right away. But long term, it's extremely essential. And long term, it's something that will help you to optimize your processes. So I'm going to show you now some of the ways you can visualize your sales funnel. So this is a screenshot of our tool. You can see here I have a funnel report. I see, OK, I have 322 new leads that came in. 322 that activated a free trial, but after activating the free trial, I lost 14. Those that were left over, the 308 that actually came to the phase of connecting with us, of getting on a call with us, out of those I lost 178. And then I qualified them. I lost 13 in that phase. I came to a meeting, and now they're on hold, and hopefully they will be converted. However, you can also see it this way. You can see the trajectory, the tra trajet de vente, um, of the leads that were won and the leads that were lost according to the date. Maybe you'll see, okay, it really, really doesn't make sense to reach out to a whole bunch of people three days before Christmas or three days before Pfingsten, which is a German holiday, because nobody will be in the office. Oh, am I missing something? No, that's right. The other thing that could be quite interesting is the time to first action. So these beautiful people in the top, those are my colleagues from the sales team, and I know immediately, okay, it takes Jean-Marc one day to get into contact with our, uh, with our leads. It doesn't mean he's doing a bad job. It may only mean that he has so many leads, he cannot get into contact with them within 12 hours. So then I know, all right, I'm not going to delegate this lead to Jean-Marc because I see it takes him already one day, Maybe I should give him a bit less lead so he can focus more on what he's doing. And maybe I should speak instead to Niels, who takes 17 hours on average to get into contact with them. Well, and this is one of my, my favorite visualizations because I think it's the most interesting thing. Why did a lead convert or not convert? What were the loss reasons? Here you see, okay, they didn't get into contact after activating a free trial. That's the biggest... Uh, blue color on the right there. About, I don't know, like 20% or so were not a fit because we could not help them with their business because they didn't have a problem that we could solve. The red part is timing. We got into contact in, on, the, at the wrong, on the wrong day, in the wrong phase of their business. Okay, that's fair. And then you have a bunch of other things. This is super helpful for you because it shows you at one glance, okay, this is where, why I'm struggling to maximize the number of sales that I'm converting. Now, this is a different visualization of the different deal sources. So, some of our leads come in through the website, others through events, like Salon des Entrepreneurs yesterday. Some of them come in through partner websites or through a reseller or an affiliate. And maybe some of them are outbound leads. And, you, and then you'll know when you look at this, okay, only two deals were outbound, so maybe I should focus more on my website and focus my time and energy into optimizing that rather than going out and spending a lot of effort chasing after uh, leads who probably don't want to get into contact with me, right? Oh, that's a bit fast. Um, so these are some ways of visualizing your lead management that some tools offer, including ours. If you don't need that specifically and maybe you need something else, it's important to think about how you want to work and how you want to achieve your goals of increasing sales and increasing growth. Think about the questions you need to ask when you come into contact with someone. Think about how you can never lose out on an opportunity and think about how you can set up a cycle that makes it super easy for your team to know exactly what to do. It doesn't mean your process has to stay that way forever. You can always optimize it because that's what anal analysis is for. That's what um, uh, reporting is for. And in order to do reporting, you have to do your registration, right? So from the very beginning, set up a process that is scalable and that helps you to achieve your goals. So I'd like to just ask a question here. How many of you have already started a business or, or want to start a business? Okay, uh, 
how many are already uh, in the phase that your business has been created and you're just about to take off? Okay, and how many of you use a CRM tool or a project management tool? Okay, great. So if there are some startups out there who are looking into investing some time and some effort into optimizing their process, we have a start startups program meaning that you can apply if you fit a certain profile, you're less than three years old, and you build a product or you have a, your own tech product, then you can be eligible to use our tool for six months for free, no strings attached, for all of our modules. And that is CRM, project management, invoicing, and ticketing. Uh, you can talk to me about that after if it's interesting for you. Yeah, that's my email address. And that's the last slide. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. I'll be around for a bit afterwards. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to know uh, if it was possible to see the your website, like the the register re registration page, because you said uh, the less you. Mm -hmm. You ask a client, mm -hmm. the more they, they will fill the, the, the form. Sure. Um, this is, I can just open up a browser here, right? Because you were actually saying that uh, 320 people were, did try the free trial, mm -hmm. and you, you were connecting with them, like you left only 14 people. That was, when that that was uh, an, sorry, that was an example. Um, so I just took it as a, an example because we, it, it constantly changes every day, right? But yes, um, of all of the people who activate, we always lose some, and we try to keep that number as low as possible. Um, and we do that by constantly evaluating, uh, constantly evaluating where we lost them, when we lost them, why we lost them. So. As you see here, this is our, our websites. Uh, maybe I should do it in, in French uh, to score some points with you guys. So here we are. This is our website. Here, you can click on one button and you fill out your name, your surname, the name of your company, your phone number, and your email. That's it. We could ask a whole bunch of other questions in the beginning to qualify them in this stage already. We could ask, do you already use a CRM tool? How big is your company? Are you interested also in project management? Because we're also thinking, okay, maybe we can upsell. We could get a whole bunch of information in the beginning, but we don't do that because we know that the more fields you have here, the less likely it is that someone will fill it out. That's, that's what you wanted to see, right? Yeah, the, the, the only thing is the phone number, is it mandatory for you? Uh, I don't think so, no. Okay. So uh, you can fill out, uh, what you can just fill out your name and your, your, your surname, and, but you have to fill out uh, your email. So I'm not sure because I've actually never <laughs> filled no. it out myself. I, I, was, uh, I, I was kind of impressed by the rate uh, you had, so that, that was the only question to know if it was mandatory to get the number or that's it yeah I mean that that's also something that it really depends on what kind of business you have and what kind of service so in Germany for example I can I'm, I'm German I work in the Berlin office I can say that people are very very careful with their data and with their data privacy so it would be very difficult for us to make it mandatory to fill out more than they really really need to fill out whereas in other countries it's maybe less of a barrier, but that's something that you should figure out for yourself and maybe do some A-B testing. It's a, a nice buzzword I can always bring in here at this point. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, how do you do when uh, your company are getting bigger? You say your leads are between seven and 13 or 15 people, but maybe one of them will go uh, and get big and have uh, uh -huh. 100 or 200 people. How do you manage that? Do you uh, do your uh, products uh, fit with a uh, bigger company? So our product, as I said, is, is focused more on the needs of small businesses. But obviously small businesses, if they're successful, they also grow. And that's a question we get a lot. But the funny thing is, is that for us, we developed our tool and our product according to the needs of our most, um, of our favorite customers, of the, cust of the, of the, of the customer type uh, that we had the most. So we saw very quickly, oh, okay, 
somehow all of these creative agencies are using our tool because they like the ticketing function and then we have lawyers who really like the email integration and tracking function that goes straight into the CRM. So we really focus the development of our product according to that, which is, where, which is why our tool is what it is today. But when we did that in the beginning, we were also still quite small. Now we've grown very much to, I mean, we've grown very quickly to about 50 people in a short amount of time. So our needs are also changing. That means that we have to think about ways in how we can accommodate the growth of our customers without overwhelming them with too many options. So we do adapt our product. Our development team says, okay, all right, we have two requests to implement this feature, but we have 170 requests to implement this feature, and those 170 requests came from businesses that made that jump from startup to scale up. So, hmm, maybe what we should do, because their, um, uh, the revenue that they bring in monthly or yearly or whatever makes up a majority of our yearly revenue, it's worth considering to implement that change. But that's something that's very, very, very specific to your product. So if I think now that Twitter, for example, Twitter now has this function that you, you, you don't just have 140 characters you can write as much as you want. I mean, maybe not as much as you want, but they probably went through months and months and months of discussions whether they want to do that, whether they want to change their product that much because what defined them in the beginning was the limitation to 140 characters. What defines us is the fact that we are extremely easy to use, super intuitive. You don't need a consultant to come and set it up. You don't need to learn it. You don't need to explain it to your team and then convince them to use it because, you know, I'm the same way. If I don't understand a product and I don't understand it immediately, I'm too lazy. I'm just going to be like, eh, nope, next. I want one that I can just use right away. So it's really worth con thinking about what your core product is and what's your USP. And if it's um, uh, beneficial to you and to, to the majority of your customers to implement that change. Um, in our case, we're very careful because we don't want to have a tool where you have a million different features that you really don't need. We have, what we do is we have some options that are not visible right away, but if a client calls us and says, hey, actually I need to have this customized and, um, uh, and uh, I, I really need this because otherwise I cannot send out my invoices or whatever, then since we've already seen that before and it's happened to us several times, but it's not the need of all of our customers, it's not public, but we will do it for you. So also think about, you know, how much time it would take your developers or your, your, your business developers to implement that change, whether it's worth the efforts and what the return on investment is. Thank you. Okay, if uh, that's it, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, feel free to write me an email um, or to come up to me later. Um, I'd be happy to chat. Thanks a lot. Merci.